because someone like Herodotus, for example, is writing about gold guarding griffins, one eyed men. He's like, this is a fantasy world we're, we're reading compared to Thucydides, where it's more he's trying to be factual. He's trying to be scientific. Would you say? Is that what you say? Well, I mean, you know, like in a court of law, I mean, he's really he is the inventor, I would say, of, of, of modern academic thinking where it's all what actually happened. And, but then I realized that, that when I was working on Homer, that Homeric or archaic Greek culture clearly had deep connections to the ancient Middle East. Circe and Calypso have, they're basically Ishtar and Eresh Kigal. Uh, and you could see, you've got to go see a, a cultural continuum that spreads at least to the Hindu. We take the cities for granted. The cities has this sort of real politic, it's all, you know, Nobody in Athens actually talked like that in public, I don't think. I don't think the actors in Thucydides, those speeches could have been delivered uh, as they are now. Uh, I think that Thucydides was scandalous uh, and he would show what he thought was really going on when other people would be saying, well, we are friends to everyone or we are rescuing people or they would have some other fiction. And Thucydides, because he doesn't care about religious thinking at all, or not very much, I should say. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, my guest is Professor Gregory Crane, who is a professor in both classics and computer science. And he is his interests are twofold. On one hand, he has published a wide range of ancient Greek authors, including uh, Hellenistic poetry and a book on the Odyssey, Thucydides. Much of his traditional scholarly work has been devoted to Thucydides. His book, The Blinded Eye, Thucydides and the Written Word, appeared from Roman and Littlefield in 1996. And um, Thucydides and the Limits of Political Realism was published by the University of California Press in 1998. At the same time, he has a long-standing interest in the relationship between humanities and rapidly developing digital technology. He began this side of his work as a graduate student at Harvard when the Classical Studies Department purchased its first TLG authors on magnetic tape in the summer of 1982. He developed a Unix-based full-text retrieval system for the TLG that was widely used in North America and Europe in the mid-1980s. He also helped establish a typesetting consortium to facilitate a scholarly publishing. Since 1995, he has been engaged in planning and development of the Perseus Project, such a big deal, which he directs as editor-in-chief. Besides supervising the Perseus Project as a whole, he has been prim primarily responsible for the development of the morphological analysis system, which provides many of the links within the Perseus database everyone who watches me knows i i'm um, i just go to perseus tusk for everything when I, etymology stuff when looking up stuff uh seeing what the greek says if i want to compare the translations i'm always looking at perseus stuff so today i have a special guest and that's gregory crane welcome to the gnostic informant and i want to start off with a story that you were telling me about before we started and so i am a collector of good translations of of sources that are in english from the ancient world and one of the, one of them i have if you, they're, they're all behind me all all six of them i think there's six one two three four yep six and this one of them is this landmark thucydides amazing translation it's filled with maps and diagrams and tons of commentary and it looks like it's been worked on by a lot of academics and people working together and sure enough there's your name in there in the appendix and you were part of this project as well. And so tell us about this. Tell us about the background of this book, and how it came about. Well, I the, the person who started the series and, and designed it is Bob Strassler. And Bob is not an academic. Bob is, Bob is in finance. I think he does venture capital or some such thing. Wow. Uh, and um, but he was sailing around the Mediterranean and happened to get to this place in Greece, Spacteria, where there was a famous battle. He became fascinated with the historical events, and so much so that he actually wrote an article that got published in a very hard to publish in scholarly venue. Uh, I think it was the Journal of Hellenic Studies. And uh, 
but he realized he wanted a better way of working with Thucydides, the, hist the historian you know, who's the source for this. And he didn't think like professors think. Professors think, well, I'm looking at the speeches. And he was thinking, of, I want the concise information. I want all the places. I want all the people. I want basic notes. Uh, and I want it carefully laid out. And I think his model was that of an investor who wants the, you know, he, they want to have the information before they put their money down uh, and in a way that they can understand. And that that perspective shaped what he did. Now, the fact is, I worked with him when he was first getting started and I actually gave him his the first computer he used because I had some Mac Macintosh SEs that Apple had donated to us when we were starting Perseus 30 years ago uh, and more than 30 years ago. Uh, and, you know, I gave him one and he used it to do his first maps. Uh, and so his work really represents the, a lot of what we do now, in part, outreach to people who are not academics, who have a leading voice, they're not just an audience, and also engagement with new ways of making primary sources ex something you can think with. Yeah, because it's all about the primary sources at the end of the day. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to put together. It's the, it's, and, and so that brings us to this Perseus project, because mm -hmm. this is just incredible. I've always wondered who's doing this. What, how did they, how does this thing come about? How do we get a database like Perseus where anybody, because in the ancient world, not everybody had access to all the information that everyone you had to be in the libraries. You had to be a scholar. You had to be part of the academy. You had to be somebody who can read and write. And so most people did not have X. Now, in this day and age, everybody can be an expert almost. Everybody can, has the ability to be an expert. I shouldn't say they, they're just going to be an expert. But everybody has the ability. Everybody's at an equal playing field as far as access to this stuff. So how does this project come about? Well, it... It, there's a number of, of threads behind it. Uh, part of one motivation is simply to make the primary sources physically available, at which you can see them. Uh, and you know, that comes from my own growing up when I became fascinated with ancient Greek in the eighth grade, and I managed to engineer my, the opportunity to go to a school where I could study Greek. I read it intensively during the summer, uh, the summers when I was in high school and I really had done a lot when I got to college. But when I was in high school and even before, I was at a very wealthy uh, uh, town, Greenwich, Connecticut, wonderful public library, but had very limited primary sources. I could read everything they had on various topics, Mongols, you know, dinosaurs, the usual things. Uh, and then with Greek, there was nothing. Uh, in order to get a Greek text, I, you know, you couldn't even order them online. They weren't even in print. And the first time I went to, Eng I got to go to England, where all I wanted was to go to the bookstore at Oxford where I could find used editions. Uh, and so that scarcity of the, the, the simple inability to get your hands on things has never left me. Like people who grew up in the depression and, and you, know, you know, are you know, paranoid about food or money. Uh, the second thing, well, thread was I had you know really cultivated an understanding of Greek and Latin and was you know walked into a very advanced linguistically advanced class when I was a, fr uh, a freshman and uh, and I kind of felt like well you should know this stuff really well and but then I realized that that when I was working on Homer that Homeric or archaic Greek culture clearly had deep connections to the ancient Middle East Circe and Calypso have they're basically Ishtar and Eresh Kigal. Uh, and you can see you've got to go see a, a cultural continuum that spreads at least to the Hindu Kush. So I said, okay, I got to learn Akkadian, Sumerian, Hittite. And I studied Akkadian for years. And I remember in my dissertation, I was trying to translate a text and there was one word and it was like, it was like two, a teeny little word with a couple of glottals. In it, and I had no idea. And I went to my professor and he said, oh, that's the late Bab Babylonia of Nadanu to give. Uh, and I said, man, I will never have that ability for this language. And this language is also badly published. It's, so I said, I'm going to build for Greek what I want for Akkadian and Sumerian. 
And I know, I, I, and you can't be an expert in everything. So if you want to do anything with any intellectual breadth, you have to have some depth somewhere, but you need to be able to move uh, more rapidly. And so that's kind of a, the driving idea, a driving idea behind Perseus. And I guess the last thread would be that I, um, you know, I, I was a graduate student at Harvard. And the one thing that Harvard does have that really is as good as it claims it should be is its library, which is the best best university library in the world. Interesting. Uh, and I could look up all my footnotes. So when I was a graduate student, I learned that if I read an article and looked everything up and saw the evidence, I never agreed with what they what people said, but I would form my own ideas. And but I, I could do that because I was in Widener Library. Sure. Uh, and I wanted, I said, I want this, the whole world should have this kind of access be, that I am privileged to have here. And that really is the, so the, you know, those are the three things, you know, information scarcity, realizing you couldn't master everything. And third, just the joy and of, of being able to have a massive library, you could look it all up and the frustration that everybody couldn't do that. Yeah. Now I want to go back. That's fascinating. I want to go back because I want to hold that thought because I want to go back to that in a, in a little bit, but I want to go back to the ancient world because now there's such a difference between how things are done today with all the, with all the tools we have now compared to the ancient world. How would somebody in the ancient world put together a piece by using other sources to construct a new source, a new story? Does that, does that make sense? Like, um, what was the process like back then? Well, that, that's a good question. It really depends on, you know, the, the period. I started as a Homerist and I'm still, and I'm sort of going back to that. And there it's a very murky topic because you're, you're dealing with is clearly an oral tradition. Uh, and you're putting together stories from prefabricated units. So you know there's, there's a way you do a speech, uh, there's or a, or a feast, there's a way you have people put on their arms. Uh, there are ways you have dialogue go back and forth. There are various patterns for battles. Uh, our Homeric epics are unbelievable tours, tour de forces uh, of um, recombining these typical scenes and these formulaic patterns. Uh, and the audience would have known what the norms were and would be able, the attentive ones, to say, ah, this person's doing something different or this person's playing off against my expectations. And there would be this complex thing going on if you were immersed in the tradition, or you could just take it as a story at, at face value. Yeah, and so coming up, because when we start seeing writings pop up, the, it seems like these stories are already well known. Like, I don't know, how do I, how do I say this? Like Homer, Homer's telling stories and a lot of these stories are sort of retellings of other stories that we find in ancient Hittites, ancient Babylonian, Egyptian. But he's retelling the story and he's putting to, putting it together into a new story. Um, mm -hmm. What do you, how how what can you tell us about that process right there? Is it is it is that a common thing? Yeah. Well, I think that the so first of all the the you're dealing with oral, instantaneous oral composition. So you could go up to an oral poet and the oral poet should be able to generate a song on the spot uh, about a particular topic. And if you describe it to them, it's kind of like a chat GPT. Uh, and uh, it would, and the way people tend to read Homer, uh, many scholars is that this is the beginning and it's the earliest thing. And if there's not a reference to something in Homer, it doesn't exist or it hadn't been invented yet. And I view it uh, as Homer's the end of, a, of an ancient tradition or uh, at, not the end, but it actually sort of is the end of the oral yeah. tradition, pretty close to that. And so uh, this, the, he's playing, the text is playing off of stories that pre-existed that it does not explicitly describe. Uh, and I can give you an example where sure. in the fifth book of the Odyssey, Hermes, Zeus sends Hermes to Agidia, where this goddess Calypso is, um, uh, has been holding Odysseus for seven years. And he says, you know, he's got to go. You got to send him back. 
she gets mad and does it does it anyway and if you line up the the actions in this in book five with the actions in the hymn to Demeter which tells the story of Persephone kidnapped by Hades and it's the same scene Zeus sends Hermes to Hades Hades has to let her go and when you do that you see at one point that many many people know uh, Persephone eats eats something she eats a pomegranate seed pomegranate. and she's forever bound at least in part to the underworld at the same point of the story Odysseus and Calypso eat but we are explicitly told that Calypso eats God's food and Odysseus eats mortal food and Odysseus has forced an oath out of her not to harm him now the audience I believe would say oh that's the Persephone story but he doesn't get trapped because he's tricky and he knows enough to exact an oath from her uh and I never you know when I remember reading as a kid I said how can it be he's so, she's so nice to him how can she how can he be so mean to her but if you see the story so an audience and you'll see this in, in lots of places in Homer you can see the story goes one direction but you you're aware it could flip to a completely different direction yeah and so this is there's this re reoccurring motif in the ancient world that I've come across so much and it's this idea of a hero and he descends down into the underworld and then he comes back up and you see this with uh Tammuz and Ishtar where Tammuz this is an ancient ancient Sumerian Babylonian yeah. this was this is going back like whoa way way before Homer like so back anyways you, you had this story where Tammuz is brought down to the underworld from a group of demons <clears throat> Ishtar goes down and she saves him and brings him back up and you know as they as she brings him up life is also brought out of the underworld that's how crops are grown there's an agricultural layer but you see this same motif occurring with isis and osiris demeter mm -hmm. and persephone like you just mm -hmm. mentioned and or orpheus going down to save per, uh eurydice and so i just wanted to point that out and a lot of my audience know, knows I've br i bring on scholars all the time to talk about this very subject recently then i don't know if you're are you aware of that dr dennis mcdonald i know the name but i'm not I sure don't know his name. I, I brought a section of his latest book it's he blew my mind because he's writing about mimesis and how mm -hmm. stories in the ancient world were oftentimes a scribe would sort of not copy but like they would see the outline of a famous text like homer and they would sort of like follow that out how the outline is and i'll give you an example you mentioned circe which is perfect it leads right up to this and here it is right here i don't know if you could see this or not yeah. but i can i can also read it out oh Odys odysseus 9 and 10 he says odysseus and his crew sailed to the land of the cyclops or well, in the book mm -hmm. of mark jesus and his disciples sailed to the region of the garrisons okay all right they're like all right yeah it's sort of similar but you know it's different but if you keep going the sequence lines yeah. up they're on the mountains of the Cyclopses. They're on the mountain of a large herd. Odysseus and his crew disembark. There's that Greek word, uh, mm -hmm. ex exathonitis. Ex uh, I can't say it. Yeah. Ex exathonitis. Yep. Ex exathonitis. Yeah. Jesus and his disciples disembark. Then they encounter a savage, lawless giant lives in a cave. They uh, Jesus encounters a savage, lawless demoniac living in a cave. And I'll skip ahead a little bit because the giant asks him for his name. Jesus asks the demoniac for his name. And I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Obviously, people can pause this and read it. As you're watching this video, you can pause this and read it. But the point is, there is so many things that line up as, as far mm -hmm. as sequence goes. Not the details. Ignore the details because the details are obviously mm -hmm. changing. We're not, we're not telling the same story. We're telling a different story. But I think it's fascinating how oftentimes you see these stories line up in certain sequence ways. And I think that's kind of, is that sort of what you were getting at before? Yes. And that is, I'd never, I, that is a wonderful uh, juxtaposition that I will use going forward. So I don't have enough connecting. And that's awesome. I'm, after this is over, I'm going to send you a link to my Dr. McDonald's book. And it's so good. It's, he's, he's literally blowing, he's, uh, he's starting a course right now. It's, on, it's going to be an online course. It's going to come out soon. So that, that's going to be out. He's going to do a course on it, but he's just, He's he's been doing this for years. He's, this is his life's work. Another one, I'll just tell it more. I'll just tell it without showing it. Another one is um, 
in the Odyssey again, once again, the Odyssey, Odysseus comes back from the war and uh, Eurycleia is rubbing his feet. And uh, she's yeah. like anointing. She doesn't know who he is. He's like, because he's been gone so long. And then she recognizes her master. And then he's like, don't tell anybody it's me. Okay. That's one story. Like, okay, what's that? What does that have to do with the New Testament? That's, well, in the New Testament, Jesus' feet is being anointed by, I think her name's Martha, but I think in, I think in Mark it's Martha, but it could be someone else. That, that's beside the point. He's, his feet are being rubbed by a woman in Mark. She, um, so the disciples are like, oh, yeah, uh, don't waste all that perfume. We can, you can use it to sell the poor. And he says, no, 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 no. What she did was better than all of you. Her fame will be told far and wide. Now you're like, okay, mm-hmm. that's different. That's not the same story. Eurycleia means fame far and wide. He yeah. literally, he literally punned her name in the story. Yeah. So yeah. I think that one, I think Dennis McDonald's on to something. You know, uh, there are some, there is some pushback on some scholars on some of his stuff, so I, which I get, which I'm not going to be like, oh yeah, he's figured it out. But I think he's on to something. I do. I true. I truly do. I mean, I, I, you know, you're going to have to try stuff, you know, if you do that and some of it will work and some of it won't. And your job is to get as much as you can that you think is plausible and it gets people talking and thinking. So there's nothing wrong with that. Right. And, and another thing he points out, too, that I think helps his case is that the process of writing or, or school, Padea in the ancient world was learning how to write Homer. Yeah. So if, if everyone who's educated learns how to write Homer, it's not yeah. that big of a stretch to think that they would be also using Homer as a guide. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Any, uh, um, my, my next question was about, and then we're, so I want to go back to the today. So language technologies mm-hmm. on our understanding of sources. Mm-hmm. What can you tell us about that? So, uh, Again, I'll go back to something that I happened, an impression that was made on me when I was a first year student, freshman, first semester. And I'm in this crazy advanced uh, Greek class where we're reading the Greek survey class, you know, thousands of lines Greek a week. And I'm actually reading all this stuff because you're young, your brain's good at that. Uh, and very pleased with myself and I've worked very hard. And at the same time, this guy who would become my my thesis advisor, whom I still see every week. In fact, I'm missing him this week because I'm, I'm in this, this meeting instead. Um, his name is Greg Nodge. Uh, and Greg would have his students learn the Greek alphabet so they could read it reasonably well. It takes about an hour. Uh, and then he would give them the print concordance to the Iliad and the Odyssey. And he would give them the Vladimir translations, which follow the line numbers of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And he would say, Take a word in the concordance, the concordance lets you sh- see where the word shows up, and look at the translations. See what, how it's translated and put the pattern together and show me, tell me what this word really means. And people, people would, this is how you learn how language works. And people were actually engaging directly with the Greek with no knowledge of Greek. And that blew me away. And uh, the, the, the canonical uh, example I used when I show this technique is I have people look at the first word of the Iliad, which is manin, which means wrath, or is translated as wrath. And I say, who else has this kind of wrath? And it's either Achilles or gods. Uh, and the inference that everyone draws is that this is kind of divine or superhuman wrath. Uh, and there's some arguments about that one way or the other, but there is a pattern in the language that you see because there's a special kind of, of, of anger word here. And this is, and so what I really like to teach my students is that they are able, they should not be, should not believe translation, and they should also not believe that they cannot get past the translation. So, and that's, that goes back almost 50 years. Yeah, that's exactly what the person who's teaching me Greek right now has been showing me that when we look at the translations, we, you, you'll see there, there's some choices being made. The mm-hmm. translator has to choose sometimes on what what word they use because Greek is so complex and there's so many things that can be there's so many variations. The one I'll just throw an example out there in the book of John, the first book, first passage of John. There's a 
the logos and the logos was with God, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Then in, in verse four, it says, and the life was the life and so and so forth. Now, the translator can choose to use that as a noun or not, which changes everything because Zoe in Greek was a was a was a, a not a character in some of these early Christian groups. She was mm -hmm. like the, another another word for the Holy Spirit, basically Zoe life. And there's actually some Nagamati texts that portray this. And so it's and, God, and John's one of the later gospels. So it's like, wait, well, this could be one of those texts. So the translator, translators choose to keep that a noun or just make it life, regular life. But like mm -hmm. that could you can translate that as Zoe and keep it as Zoe and leave it as a name, and that changes mm -hmm. everything. So that mm -hmm. one one word translation can make a whole different meaning to the text. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, now let me ask you this: Do you haven't do you? What do you know any ex examples of that right now, and and like some translations that you see that you would personally think that should be a little sh that you would translate differently? Maybe that's kind of a every I, page. Every really? Page. So I and and it's funny because now I'm teaching first year Greek, and you know, and in, in many departments, it's like well, first year Greek is you know, I'm a I'm a full professor here and I'm doing intro Greek and usually somebody else would do that, but I think it's the most important subject there is. And I love doing it. I'll, I'll talk about Greek all day. Uh, and, uh, but one thing that's changed in my attitude was I used to think you're focus a lot on production and being able to compose and generate ancient Greek because that does help in, in comprehension, but I don't, the students don't have enough time to spend, four years or three years studying Greek uh, anymore. It's just not in their schedule. And I need to be able to give them something in a year that they can use. Well, it's not any longer a situation like it was for me where I'm sitting with an Oxford classical text. And if I don't know a word, I'm screwed. There's nothing I can do. I can't match that word to the dictionary entry. I can't construct a sentence. Well, we have, you know, curated, analyses for 1.4 million words of Greek, where, you know, every single word we know, this is the subject of the verb, this is the object, uh, it's, this is an imperfect. Uh, and the issue is really now uh, is the student has a translation and they have a source text. And how do they negotiate between them? And how do they see what the translation is doing to the source text? We're reading Xenophons and Abbases right now. We're very old school for various reasons. And my students in second semester, what every class they do Greek to English in the textbook, and then they align at with a, a tool we use called Ugarit uh, at the word and phrase level, the translation to the Greek. And of course, they can't do it all the time because the translation constantly changes things and changes things for no good reason often. Or to me, you know, why you know, they, the shift in sentence structure doesn't materially improve the English and it confuses the you know, bejesus out of my students. But they learn, you know, there's decisions on every sentence. Yeah. Wow. I'm just I'm trying to think of the next how to follow that. So it's fascinating. What do you think? What do you think it is about the Greek language that makes it so complex compared to or is it maybe this is this like this for all languages maybe well i think that first of all i just want to make it clear i love i love languages i love ancient languages and so i have a you know greek is the thing i most promote but i i want to promote them all i don't want to yeah. i don't want to say greek is the best i do happen to like it a lot me too <laughs> you know i think that not all so greek had this well a, a complicating you could you can argue disastrous effect on all modern languages. So, you know, you, you read complex German prose, and I've been working on some 19th century German, and it's, it's these, these people were producing Cicero, and, and Cicero is meeting Demosthenes, and they are, they are creating these huge, complicated sentences. Uh, I, I showed an example of, uh, of a passage from the symposium that one of our students aligned to a modern translation. Uh, uh, and uh, the modern translation reads very easily. It's got like seven sentences, and each sentence is straightforward. That's one sentence in the Greek. 
Uh, and, wow. and, and you, in the Greek, you've got to like manage all these subordinate clauses and keep track of everything. Uh, and, and so the, the English provides you with a the appearance of simplicity that, that is not, does not do justice to the complexity of the Greek or Thucydides where if you read a translation of Thucydides, it makes sense. If you read the Greek, it doesn't make sense sometimes. And we have Dionysius of Halicarnassus, a later Greek author writes about one passage and Thucydides says, I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> That's um, so cool. Yeah. yeah. So um, what is it like to put together? I mean, so when Perseus stuff started, was there... That were you borrowing data from somewhere else? Is there some sort of German philologist book somewhere? Yeah, I would say for much of our, it's an interesting question. Is for a lot of our early work consisted of taking information that was in print form. In some cases, we would take like a dictionary, and we would then extract the logical information that was encoded inconsistently in the dictionary format. So you would see thalata ace, hey, for example, for Greek words. E, and that's the thalatas, the, the nominative singular, ace tell you, tells you it's a certain kind of attic declension or short alpha declension, and the hey tells you it's gender. If you can extract that information, you can say, I got a stem thalat, and this is the way you can generate endings. So we spent a lot of time, first thing I did was pull as much linguistic information I could out of the, what was called the intermediate Greek a little Scott lexicon. And years later, we enter the bigger lexicon, and I really wanted the morphology. But so you and so there's a lot that you do where you're building on print sources, and then you're writing programs that exploit that knowledge to create new kinds of links and connections that you couldn't do. So then we I built a system where you could go from more or less any inflected form in a Greek text and see what is possible morphological part of speeches would be. Is it, you know, uh, subjunctive? Is it, it optative? Uh, and what its dictionary form could be. Uh, now, you know, we, we're at the point where we're encoding the syntax. We can encode, um, you know, who's speaking. Uh, we encode, you know, you can encode, um, you know, place names. So where is this, like, basically the, the landmark Thucydides, you can do that online. Uh, so there's a lot, and and we're starting to see like translations. I worked on a translation of Iliad one and Odyssey five with one of my my students who's now graduated. But our goal is to explain to someone what's going on in the Greek for each and every word. And so, and we really want our goal is to serve the Greek, uh, not replace it. Uh, and it's a different way of thinking. Uh, than uh, you know, a literary translator would have. What is the what is the future of Perseus? Like, what's what can we look forward to in the future with Perseus Tufts? Is it going to any transformations anytime soon? Is there going to level up? Is going to be more books edit, added, like more database stuff? Well, it's funny you ask because we are getting ready for the next six months. We'll be ro rolling out what I would call. The, Perseus 6, like the sixth major version of Perseus. But honestly, it is the most, the biggest transformation of any version of Perseus, you know, since Perseus 1. Uh, and it's different as we've been working for decades, literally 20 years, on some of these things. Like, you know, I talk about syntactic analysis, uh, alignments of the word and phrase level between translation and source text links between place names to maps, uh, metrical analysis. So I'm looking at a piece of poetry, what are the longs and shorts and what does it sound like? Uh, so there's a better coverage of, or ability to have, uh, to show you what words show up in a dictionary, more grammatical annotations. So we really have a, 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 a what we call our beyond translation uh, project. Uh, and what we'll be doing is, you know, the, the lead will be Homer because there's so much open data available. But differences are a lot of the, the most important information we have is produced by students and non-specialists, which I find wow. incredibly exciting. Me too. 
I mean, when I was an undergraduate, you know, I'm at Harvard, I'm like this crazy, dedicated, absolutely absorbed classicist. I'm like, I do this undergraduate thesis and just like live this thing. And I remember when people read it, I realized they didn't take it seriously. Uh, they, it's like, ah, oh, that's very nice, you know, kid, and we'll read your thing and, and grade it, but we don't really care what you think. And I was really crushed that, it, and, and, and never got over it. And so I love being able to turn, tell my students, you're going to do something and other people are going to use it for a long time. And it's going to be a value. That is incredible that you just made a really good point there. Like that's going to be, and that's going to, I think that's going to help people's education too. Like they're what? striving towards something that's going to be long, like permanent, basically. Like they're going to be working on something that's going to add to the day, the knowledge base of, of it, us humans. You know what I mean? Like it's pretty incredible. Well, it's, it's just, I'm, now it's hard. It takes my breath away. And I'll give you an example. So my this thesis advisor of mine, Greg Naj, you know, he decides he wants to digitize this, the most important manuscript of home. And my attitude at the time was, oh man, we don't work on manuscripts anymore. I didn't even take the, the course on manuscripts called paleography. We work on post-colonial theory. We work on the body. We do other cool things. And you know, okay, but you know, you're the director of the Center for Linux Studies, you can do this if you want. So he digitizes this thing, is a picture, this beautiful, spectacular, high resolution image of this manuscript full of annotations of scolia, uh, and set like six or seven categories of annotation engineered onto this page. It really is important. Uh, and the way they edited it was over about 10 years roughly 200 students, master students, but mainly undergraduates, did all of the editing. Uh, I couldn't believe it. And they did most of it uh, you know, for free as a club uh, activity. Uh, and some would get some summer money to work. But there was people would gather, particularly at Holy Cross, uh, the College of the Holy Cross, an hour away from me in Worcester, on Friday afternoons, and work in groups of 10 or 15 students on different projects for fun to advance human understanding. Doing things I never, I, I couldn't believe they could read this stuff. But the, but the impact of going from being a subject in the bureaucracy of academia to a, a citizen in, the repu in a republic of, of knowledge where you have a voice and obligations and opportunities, transformative. Wow, that's just, that's just incredible. Um, now, I was asking about your, when I emailed you, I, I wanted to ask you about your book with about, about Thucydides. And you mentioned that it's been a while since you've uh, touched on it. And you said that there, you might have done it differently today if you wrote that book today. Can you talk about that? Like, what, what, what do you mean by that? So let me I summarize, you know, it's a pretty simple idea to the book. And so uh, people had observed that Thucydides mentions women, or the term woman at least, one-tenth as often as Herodotus, Herodotus ten times more. And they had inferred that Thucydides was a misogynist, uh, and, and he probably was, but uh, I actually I went and looked and said, well, let's look at terms for sons, brothers, husbands, all kinship terms. And what I discovered is they were all uh, one-tenth uh, as frequent in Thucydides as in Herodotus. That it wasn't just women per se, it was the family and family connections that were pushed to the side uh, in Thucydides. And in reality, in, you know, much of ancient Greece was all about who you knew and your family connections, and your ties. And it shows up in Thucydides, but it's, but really primarily in Thucydides, it's isolated individuals and the state. Uh, it's a very modern totalitarian view of the world and reductive. Uh, and so I went through and, and traced that and wrote a book that, you know, maybe people see it, maybe they don't. What I would, and what I would do now is I would still collect the same statistics I did, you know, more easily now than I could then. But I would also link back my conclusions into the text of Thucydides so you could see well, this is, 
here is a, a reference to women, but it's not common. I'd like to be able to find some way to make the results of the research visible to the reader. Uh, so imagine, uh, you know, you are reading something you know, people talk about, say, sentiment analysis and is what kind of emotions are there in this text? And what they'll usually do is publish an article with tables, maybe a few quotes, not many. What would interest me is saying, OK, well, let's show you the words that are typical of this author. Uh, and let's show you the words that we tagged as being anger or whatever. So you can see this theme in all of its terms as it moves through the text. In other words, how do you enhance the reading experience and let people see things that they wouldn't have noticed otherwise? That gives them more, allows them to detect more patterns, uh, to get more out of what they're doing. Yeah, that's interesting. So you think that with a native Greek reader, when they're reading Thucydides, would certain things are going to be apparent as they're reading through this text but when we once we translate that text we sort of lose that a little bit mm -hmm. that's and, interesting and, I, and i'm not not even in a lot of these things would be unconscious so for example when you talk about you know we, I, you know I, in my life we had changed some of the words that i would use because I'll, i would realize oh that that word is only used applied to women for example it's a sexist term i should not use that term i got to rethink my vocabulary how do you detect that? You know, you got to look at the patterns. You, but you would not know the notice. I didn't notice those patterns until they were pointed out to me. So, um, you know, so yeah. So you would. It, it, so it's not just what a native speaker would see, uh, but there are things like where themes will be lost in the translation because the the translation does not recognize that the same roots are being used, uh, yeah. or even the same word is being used. That's that's so fascinating. It's such a it's all there's there's these layers that are there when a when a, a natural when a native speaker is writing or speaking in a certain language, then those layers are apparent of the new. As soon as you translate it, those layers you can't see them anymore. They're go mm -hmm. and now early Christianity. I want to talk about this and sort of end on this a little bit. Um well gear yeah. The early Christianity is involved with a lot of different languages. So not just Greek, but also there might be some Hebrew idioms. There might be some Latin, maybe Latin idioms, maybe Syriac or whatever. What would you, what do you think is the process? What do you think we should do uh, as far as like translating these texts? So, you know, we have the way I would, I we're doing it. Uh, so how we would do it is how we do do it is we would start with translation and align every single word or phrase, whatever unit makes sense, to the original source text as closely as possible. We would provide uh, full linguistic analysis for every single word in the source text. We would provide grammatical explanations of, you know, fuller grammatical explanations of what's going on. You know, this is a this is a data because it's showing place within. Well, this is a data because it's instrumentality. Uh, and um, we would provide a transliteration. Uh, we would ideally provide a, a recording, at least one person, so it becomes real language in your in your ears. And we would, of course, provide the ability to search, so you can see. Well, where else does this word show up? How is it translated? Have I been consistent uh, in translating, or is this the same word? And I give you a classic example: is, is the English word love, which will translate eros in Plato and agape in New Testament Greek. And uh, they're completely different terms. Right. Translation masks that. Uh, and Such so, a big... yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> and I'll give you the, the whole thing with like these other languages, like Syriac, for example. I was working on the Gospel of Thomas with some people at Virginia, and we digitized the version of it. Uh, and first of all, I, we looked, they, they picked. We picked two different editions, 20 years apart for the same guy. And I said, OK, not a big deal. Second edition, he'll change some commas, you know, word here or there. Completely different, almost totally different stories. You couldn't even line them up well. So I just fascinated with how much variation there was in that. But they also would talk about the Syriac version. Well, when they, when they cite the Syriac version, they don't cite the Syriac. They cite the English translation of the Syriac. 
And these are really, you know, very badass, you know, philologists who know everything. And they just gave up. It was not even, they didn't even try to do the Syriac. And to me, the opportunity is, that, okay, well, let's try to go uh, make the Syriac visible uh, as well to the people who don't know Syriac. Uh, or the Coptic, or, uh, or the Georgian, or the classical Armenian, or whatever language you're talking about. Uh, and this is so that, is that you're not just locked out. And I think that one of the things that's different is we have the ability to generate linguistic analyses now uh, for dozens of languages. So people are accustomed to machine translation. On my Twitter feed, I follow Persian, Ukrainian, and Russian every day. I don't know any of those languages. Uh, and you know, the translation works well enough. Uh, but it, we can go beyond that. We can get a, a thing that will tell you, oh, this is the subject of the verb, and this is, and here's the noun, and it's in the genitive case. Uh, and all of a sudden, you're working directly uh, with a source text. Uh, nowadays, there's, they, they use a thing called universal dependency framework. So when you figure out how to work with Greek, it's pretty easy to work with any other Indo-European language. A little more work to go Semitic or to an agglutinative language, but you have a start. So we have the framework now so that you would have your specialist language languages that you know pretty you know reasonably well. And that detailed knowledge allows you also to critically use languages you don't know. Because you have a sense of, well, I know these are the kinds of things I don't know. But here's what I'm getting. You're, and and it'd be for Christian early Christian studies with all these languages that nobody, they know hardly anybody teaches. Uh, you know, it's the possibilities are enormous. Wow. This is just it just makes me realize this is like this work is not easy. <laughs> There's a lot of factors at play, and these these words are have different meanings different contexts and like you mentioned agape or eros how do you portray which one it is or logos versus lexi yeah is logos has a different meaning than the than just regular word like mm -hmm. we're talking about words we're talking about we use the word lexi for that right but we're talking about a specific idea of like divine rational truth mm -hmm. that's logos so how do you, how do you maneuver that? How do you, and so the question would be, do you actually change it to like in the beginning was divine reason instead of saying the word, you know, what is, what do you think about that? Well, I think you would have the option of not having to choose or having options, the option of having options. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, my old, my old friend and, and thesis advisor, Reg Naj has spent years creating translations where he includes the Greek word, you know, next to the English. So you can see, or sometimes he just leaves the English out for a common Greek word because he wants you to see exactly what's lying there. And then you can think about, does it, how do you translate Logos in the beginning of the Gospel of John? Uh, and I mean, there's one, one issue is delivering a, an opinion. The other issue is allowing people to see there's a question. Uh, and I think that the the, first, the second is more important. They've got to know there's, it's not just a simple answer here. There's other ways to think about it. And, and they should know that there are these other ways, even if they don't want to go pursue it at that moment. So for example, like when you have these, these modern Bibles that have commentaries on the bottom and the margin, you might see like a little asterisk and then on the bottom it explains, Hey, this word could mean this. That's right. But what I would want is, then a link to a network to all the evidence. If you have the time, all the evidence for this interpretation versus that interpretation should be available and usable, which means it should have the Greek and the and the translation or whatever the original source text and a translation and all the annotations you need to, to actually look at that source text and you know make up make up your own mind as to whether you believe what they're telling you. Nice. The last thing I want to touch on is um, I, right before we started this, um, I was reading your in the appendix of the Stra the Strassler Thucydides, and you have this really nicely written, um, I guess, you, what would you call it, an article or a chapter 
And the first thing you said was Greek religion and Thucydides is much like the famous dog in the Sherlock Holmes tale who provided a clue because he did not bark in the night. Um, I'll just keep reading it, actually. Thucydides' comparative silence on Greek religious practices and institutions dramatically illustrates the rationalizing and secular nature of his work. Herodotus, for example, refers to the famous sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi more than five times as often as Thucydides does. So what do you, can you uh, elaborate on this a little bit? This is a very fascinating uh, um, something to point out. Well, I think one of the things that I love about Thucydides and that it's, I really try to communicate is uh, Thucydides, we take Thucydides for granted. Thucydides has this sort of real politic. It's all, you know, we have an empire, we like empires. You'd have an empire too, if you could. Uh, and they don't, you know, screw around. They're, they're pretty uh, reductive. And nobody in Athens actually talked like that in public, I don't think. I don't think the actors in Thucydides, those speeches could have been delivered uh, as they are now. Uh, I think that Thucydides was scandalous uh, and he would show what he thought was really going on when other people would be saying, well, we are friends to everyone or we are rescuing people or they would have some other fiction. And Thucydides is relentlessly, uh, he's, he's all too familiar to people who live in a secular society because he doesn't care about religious thinking at all, or not very much, I should say. And people say, well, of course you don't. Every sensible person doesn't. We're, and, and so that's the edge uh, that Thucydides brings is lost uh, because he's, he's deceptively familiar to us, which makes us not realize how modern and transgressive and disruptive he would have been in the fifth century. Wow. Because someone like Herodotus, for example, is writing about gold guarding griffins one-eyed men he's like it's just a fantasy world we're, we're reading compared to thucydides where it's more he's trying to be factual he's trying to be uh he's trying to be scientific would you say is that would you say well, that? i mean you know like in the court of law i mean he's really he is the inventor i would say of of, of modern academic thinking where it's all what actually happened uh, right. and how and he doesn't have footnotes this goes back to your question about how you compose. He basically says, you know, I, I, I'm going to give you my best guess. He tells you that in the beginning of, of the history. And in part, there's, there's not, no such thing as a footnote. There's no way to, to, to regularly say, I talked to four different sources, and they told me three different stories. Uh, and, you know, here's, what I, here's my best guess of what's happening. He tells you he does that, but he, he can't give you you know the the apparatus you can't see what he's doing yeah this is such a good i i, I gotta people gotta go read this 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 appendix that you wrote this is really and you, you're mentioning how in book six or no book seven i'm sorry there there's a eclipse of the moon frightened the athenians into delaying their retreat from syracuse and led to the annihilation of the entire expedition so thucydides is telling the story and it, it's like he's coming off as a skeptic of these religious ideas, like, mm -hmm. like a modern day skeptic would like somebody that's, I, I never thought about it like that until you pointed it out here. And, yeah. um, and another thing you talked about too, is how the Greeks don't have a central text, like the Quran. It's, it's mm -hmm. about the rights. Mm -hmm. Can you mm -hmm. speak on that? And then we'll, that'll be the last question. Yeah, and I, I, so I've been sitting in on a colleague of mine's uh, course, Introducing Japanese Culture. Uh, and every class I go to is, I have a, I have a whole new course I've got to teach on like no plays and Greek drama or uh, the tale of the Heike and the Iliad or, um, you know, travel literature and Pausanias and in, in uh, Japanese. But one of the things that really strikes me is these guys, these Japanese warriors are pretty brutal people, but they're Zen Buddhists. Uh, and they have, they, they live within a very complex moral framework. They may be not, among, not our framework, but they do. It's like, it's, the Greeks, it's a free for all. If there's no, if someone Greek kills you, kills someone else, it, you can say it's against justice and so on, but it doesn't go very far. Uh, until you have Plato, who really says, starts to talk about absolute values of truth and, and justice, 
Uh, and you, you do the just thing, not because it's, you know, utilitarian, which is Thucydides argument. Uh, you do it because it's sort of a transcendent argument for why justice is good. Uh, and uh, that's a, it, that is a really foreign space to us. Uh, and I don't think we can, we can think of ourselves into that uh, moral, uh, uh, pre-philosophical, much less pre-complex religious uh, system. Such a fascinating time in the world, man. Like, I, you almost want to be able to, like, go into a parachute and travel back in time and just, like, look down and watch everything happening. Watch watch as the Eleusinian mysteries are taking place. Yeah. Just, like, watch these, maybe not the battles, maybe not, that might not be cool to watch that, but uh, maybe for a few seconds, and then you're probably going to, like, oh, get me out of here. <laughs> but anyways, just to see how the world looked, how people dressed, what the mm -hmm. buildings look like, the columns, the you want to like you just want to be there and just check it out. Maybe you don't want to live that, that life. That was probably a hard life to live. You 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 get this like romantic, oh the world the ancient world was so great. No, it actually wasn't. People didn't live long and you worked you worked very hard every day and on your crops and on your animals and you didn't really you didn't just hang out on the internet all day and do TikTok. It wasn't like today. So any last thoughts on anything projects coming up? Um, you, talk, you already talked about how Perseus is going through some, some nice uh, things in the future, but anything about for you in particular? Well, I think that the big, there are a couple of threads. The first is there's the, if you have a subject such as classical studies, and I don't like the term, but if you're going to use it, you cannot just equate it with Greco-Roman studies. And that, that's a European perspective. It's got all sorts of problems. And if you want an instance of structural racism, that's one right there. Uh, that yes, and my department at Harvard was called the classics, not just department of classics. Uh, and the person who instituted that really was, you know, a person with, with problematic ideas. Sure. So you've got to, so we teach, you know, what classical historians at Tufts the last two years was classical Arabic historians writing about sub-Saharan West Africa uh, with histories in composed in Timbuktu. Fascinating. Uh, when we when I teach epic, I do an, a month of West African epic, two weeks of Persian epic, two weeks of Old English, and four weeks of Homer. So I'm half in Europe, half out. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with things like Syriac, and, and we could probably teach Coptic because they published kinds of pre-banks linguistic data that we would need so you can start to use it. Uh, I'm fascinated with, the general thing is we are looking at a third way of interacting with language. One way is I know the language, I, I you know I have mastery. The other is I, I don't know the language, I have a translation. Now there's a space in between where the translation is your starting point. And what interests me is what happens is that that experience generalizes. Uh, when I, I teach digital humanities seminars, we look at these techniques and I'll, I'll have students do things like uh, look at YouTube video songs in, in languages like Latvian and Serbian. Uh, and, uh, and I'll challenge them, you know, say, okay, start with the machine translation, but then use this other tool to analyze the language. So you tell me what each word is doing, uh, not just, you know, another translation. And let's think about what this tells us about, you know, the culture uh, or politics of the people who are singing in these contexts. And it opens up worlds for them that would be, first, they never would have seen it before something like YouTube. And secondly, even if they can't see it on YouTube, they don't understand it until they use these tools. And some of what you may learn may not make you happy. Uh, when you see what they're thinking about, but it's in, but that's all the more reason to understand it. So it's a. Uh, I'll just finish by saying the way we work with Greek texts was going to distinct to Greek. It's like legal language, so it works very well to go to law school when you've been doing Greek. But now the same way I, my students and I work with the Greek text is how I would work with a Russian text uh, that I have, and I don't know Russian. I haven't studied Russian. But I can I can get the linguistic analysis for every word, and I can start to see well what's really going on here, and I can get past and see what has the translator done, and I can say well what is this word? I want to see this word in a hundred contexts, and 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 
by looking at the translation, I can start to see myself what this word really means. So it's the generalization. So generalization of what we're doing to other languages, the transformation of how we think about the, the past such that we have a, a model of the ancient world that represents the people in the United States uh, and their, very, their, their different backgrounds. Uh, and how do we transform the social contract between academic humanities, like what I get paid to do, and the intellectual life of humanity? I'm not interested in writing books for professors uh, or in, in participating in closed networks of specialists who only, only want to talk to each other. Wow. So this kind of, you know, being on, it, on, on your uh, YouTube uh, video is like a dream to me because this is, this is what I listen to. Uh, I probably spend too much time watching people, uh, entrepreneurial people talking about intellectual topics, uh, you know, in this medium, uh, and not as much time reading myself, but it is very compelling. Uh, and I think actually a very good, a, a, a big advanced intellectual life. Wow. Thank you for that. And I really, I, I, I couldn't agree more on trying to and that's what my me and my buddy derek from myth vision podcast who's doubled his double the audience i have um he i really been follow he's sort of been my inspiration in doing this kind of stuff we're trying to make this information available to everyone and explain mm -hmm. like because i'm not an expert but i like to talk to experts and, and understand where they're where they're at in their field and then try mm -hmm. to is my try to do my best to explain it the way I think they might want to hear it. And sometimes it works. Like I get a lot of feedback from it saying, you know, people, people like what, what we're doing here. And so it's, I think this is important. And like you said, not just have uh, people in academia, just in this circle, just talking to each other and know and understand, because there's so much information that most people don't know that is like mind blowing as mm -hmm. far as like the ancient world that people yeah. just don't have, it's not a household thing that people know. And like you, you tell people, hey, this professor taught me this. They're like, whoa, I didn't know that. So there's a lot of stuff out there. And um, you're obviously I'm gonna have you back on because you're welcome. If you if you enjoyed this as much oh, as you I, say, love it. I would love to have you on more often. And uh it's good to have, especially someone like yourself who's involved in the Perseus project. Like, wow, I'm I'm hands down, thank you for that. And you you're helping out the people like myself learn without even have to go to school, I have to go to college. I can just like I'm learning Greek from a from a from a private teacher. I'm reading the text. I'm trying, you know. I'm not saying that I'm going to learn more than someone who does get a PhD, for example. I'm not saying that, but like, hey, I'm learning. You know, I'm somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of the best people were taught themselves. I mean, it's 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 uh, uh, you know the per so there's a lot of people, citizen scholars, who did foundational work, uh, and it's being able to make it. You make it allow more people to realize that ambition uh, and to realize that part of themselves and make become more fully human in that way is, you know, there's, I can't think of anything more exciting or satisfying to, to contribute to. Well, thank you for your time. And uh, links are in the description to find you. And um, what, what was your, what, what, what would you say as far as people can find you as a Twitter? Twitter, I'm philologist GRC. Okay. Uh, and uh, and that's probably the, a good way to follow what I do. And then there's the person. If you look at the Perseus homepage, you'll get updated on things now. So uh, and there will be a big some. Hopefully, we'll have some announcements, some new material. I'm working on documentation right now. Uh, in the next few weeks. Well, those links those links are in the description, and you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jeez.